Welcome to Other Voices, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. I'm your host, Paul George. On this month's edition of Other Voices, we're going to take a deep look at the state of our American democracy. Campaign 2016 is turning out to be unlike any other presidential election in recent history, and it may be having a transformational effect on American politics. Whether that's good news or very bad news, we'll find out in a few months. All told, what we're going to do on this program is try to answer the question that my guest poses at the outset of his book, How Did We Get Into This Mess? My guest is Doug McAdam. He is the Ray Lyman Wilbur Professor of Sociology at Stanford University and the former director of the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences. He's the author or co-author of 18 books and some 85 other publications in the area of political sociology with a special emphasis on race in the U.S., American politics, and the study of social movements and contentious politics. Contentious politics, that's why I invited him here tonight. <laughs> he has recently updated his 2014 work, Deeply Divided, Social Movements and Racial Politics in Post-War America, and it's supposed to be coming out soon in paperback. Doug, welcome back it's to It's always Voices. great to be here. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Um, Doug was last here a couple years ago um, for the uh, special show on the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer, and he's also written a great book on that called, appropriately enough, Freedom Summer. Let's start with uh, just a couple of quick definitions. Uh, in the introduction, I, I said you work in the area of political sociology. I think most people are familiar with what sociology is. Mm -hmm. What is what's that, what's different about political sociology? Well, I mean, the, it, it's the study of politics, but uh, and polit I share a lot of the same focus with political science. But political science, at least in the United States, almost exclusively focuses on formal political institutions. Uh, political sociology tends to have a broader definition of politics, so I study social movements and other forms of contentious politics, both in the U.S. and elsewhere. So it's a slightly broader vision, if you will, of politics, of the study of politics. All right. And uh, studying contentious politics, I guess, has turned out to be a pretty good career move. <laughs> yeah, lots of headaches, but uh, never lack for topics, that's for sure. And um, before we get into the details, let's, let's just get kind of a quick overview of your thesis. Obviously, the subtitle of your book, Racial Politics and Social Movements, in post-war America, you're looking at these as two big driving factors, and that's what we're going to talk about yep. tonight, is how we got there and where that has led to tonight. Is, yep. But is that right? Um, yeah, those are, uh, yes, there are two, I think those are the true, two principal forces that have pushed the two parties increasingly far apart, and it's, in a sense, the country very, very far apart. And we can talk about each of those mechanisms if and, and when you want to. We, By the way, let me give a shout out to my co-author, yes. Karina Clues who was a spectacular graduate student of mine at, uh, at, at Stanford. So wanted her, her to get credit here, too. Is she still over there? Or is she no, no. There? She's taken a really interesting job as the director of research for a women's empowerment organization in Seattle. Oh, great. Well, wish her our, our best. I will. So um, we do have to, in order to understand what's going on now, roll back and, and, and do some history. And um, I can't go back through all the history that you include in this, but I think maybe a good place to start is um, the late 50s, early 60s, and, and through the 60s, what emerged is the Republican Southern strategy. Right. Uh, I think that's a pretty important yep. dynamic that's, that's carried forward. Absolutely. I mean, as we, as we sort of uh, take this little historical tour, you know, it's worth reminding ourselves just how different the two parties were in that period, late 50s, early 60s. Uh, this always shocks my students. It won't shock most of you here, but uh, 
who were the Republicans circa 1960? Well, uh, they were moderate centrist in kind of political orientation. The dominant kind of figures in the party were moderate Republicans, moderate centrist Republicans. Uh, the party was basically centered um, in the Midwest and in the Northeastern United States, somewhat surprisingly. De uh, New York was a routinely uh, reliable uh, Republican state. <laughs> Um, lots of ideological overlap with Democrats. That is, there were many Republicans in Congress who were much more liberal on a wide range of issues than their Democratic counterparts. Today, there is not a single, the most liberal Republican is to the right of the most conservative Democrat. There's literally no overlap uh, between the two parties in Congress. And most interestingly, the Republicans were consistently more liberal on matters of race. Uh, the Dem so who were the Democrats circa 1960? In the aggregate, they too were moderate centrist in kind of their ideological the sort of center of gravity within the party. They were centered um, in the southern United States. The foundation of the party was the South, the Dixiecrats, so-called Dixiecrats. Again, as I said, lots of ideological overlap with Republicans. That is, many more, many Democrats were more conservative than many Republicans, and they were. Can, they were schizophrenic, actually, on the issue of race, simultaneously housing the most progressive liberal members of Congress and the most conservative on the matter of race. That's who the two parties were. Uh, and they had been that way. That, that structure of American politics had been in place, one can argue, since the beginning of the Civil War. Okay? Um, it's all about to change and change very quickly and largely as a function of the centrifugal force of social movements, two parallel movements, pushing the parties off center. But let me highlight again just how tightly aligned circa 1960 the two parties were. Um, if I asked you guys to hazard a guess as to how many enactments came out of Congress in any given two-year session in the post-war period, Offer, offer a guess. It's not really fair because you go, what the heck's an enactment? Is that a big consequential bill? No, it's anything that Congress votes on. You, you could decide next week, is next Tuesday is going to be National Frisbee Day. And if you got a vote out of Congress, that's an enactment. So Just naming post offices has got to be 400 a year. <laughs> exactly. So, in any case, what? 700. 1,000. 1,500. You guys are really good, actually. <laughs> um, we, in that post-war period, we were averaging 14, 15, 1,600 enactments in a two-year session of Congress. We topped out over 2,000, and I can't remember which Congress. I think it was 50-51. I don't really remember. Guess where we are now? The last two sessions of Congress, 267 and 289 the two lowest totals in 20th century American history. There's no bipartisan cooperation. There's no ability to make deals because there's no ideological overlap. So the centrist positions of the two parties in that post-war period created lots of opportunities for bipartisan cooperation. This is the most dynamic period in congressional history. This was a legislative engine of real significance. Uh, We've long since, we're long since uh, gone, moved away from that. And this process started in the 60s through the force of two social movements pushing the two parties off center. The civil rights movement aggressively pushing Democratic administrations, Kennedy and Johnson, off center and increasingly left on issues of race, but lots of other social issues as well. Simultaneously, the civil rights movement set in motion a very powerful white backlash, another movement of sorts in the United States, not just in the southern United States at all. And the Republicans sought to court the votes of disaffected white Southerners and other racial conservatives who were concerned about the pace of the movement and the changes that were happening in American society. And the Republicans start moving sharply right uh, under the pressure or the opportunity afforded by the white backlash. At the same time, the Democrats are moving left. The process has continued to the present day with the parties continuing to move away from each other. 
But this pattern was fully in place by the end of the 1960s. So that the, the, the Democrats uh, had lost essentially the southern wing of the party and now were oriented more to the liberal northern labor wing of the party, if you will. And the Republicans had become really a party, or beginning to become, a party of white racial conservatives. One other factoid to bore you with, in 1956, 40% of African American voters voted Republican. They voted Eisenhower. 4% uh, voted for Nixon in 68. So we have a racial polarization of the electorate, and we have a regional realignment going on very rapidly. And those forces are going to push Ameri the two parties off center, further and further away from each other, and transform the structure of American politics that had been in place for roughly 100 years. It's an incredible change in, in such a short time. There yep. had never been such a realignment in, in politics uh, such as this. Not since the Civil War. There were, there were a couple really critical <laughs> uh, sort of shifts, realignments prior to the Civil War, but nothing, nothing from the Civil War roughly to the 1960s. And the lack of any kind of ideological overlap that, that you referred to, whereas there used to be a, a lot, I know from reading your book, there's sociologists have a term for it and, and measure it, but the, the gap there is unprecedented currently, right? There's, there's never been such a, a distance between the two That's parties. That's right. The, 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 when I characterize the kind of the lack of ideological overlap in Congress, uh, this is literally something that's been measured for the whole of American history by two political scientists, uh, Poole and Rosenthal. And they, they, they've developed a very sophisticated <clears throat> model for essentially measuring the ideological closeness and, or distance between any two members of Congress through their voting records. And at the present moment, the House is more polarized than it's ever been in American history, and the Senate is right at sort of its, its peak period of polarization. So there's a lot of history. I recommend the book. To, to learn this history, but um, since we're limited on time tonight, let, let's roll up quickly and um, get to 2008, the election of Barack Obama and the eventual emergence of, of the Tea Party, right. um, which is the next major movement that, that you're looking at. Um, let's start with um, a story you relate uh, about something that happened the night of Barack Obama's inauguration in Washington, D.C. There is, I mean, well documented, and none of the participants have, um, I mean, they, they've acknowledged it. Uh, while the, the, the inaugural balls were going on, uh, a, a group, a relatively small group of Republicans gathered to plot strategy for how to leaders, make sure Republican, Republican leaders, Republican leaders to, to ensure that Obama would indeed be, be a one-term president. And it involved uh, sort of legislative hostage taking, threats to shut down government, uh, all the things that have in fact played out on Obama's watch. And then in the midterms, um, we have the emergence of the, um, in 2010, the emergence, the beginnings of, of the Tea Party. Right. So let's talk a little bit about where they came from and, and what they did and, and how that social movement, I assume you define it as a social sure, movement, sure, sure. Um, has continued this widening, this widening. Yeah, and I don't want to go back to history because I want to focus on the now, but uh, the Tea Party is, is only one of a number of movements um, on the right uh, since the white backlash of the 60s that have continued to push the Republican Party further to the right. There's, there's any number of other movements, but the Tea Party is obviously critically important yeah. to an understanding of where we are now. The, yeah, the, these other movements continued like opposition to social programs, you know, the social safety well, net. Pro-life was uh, another important movement, the tax revolt in the late 70s, early 80s that helped uh, uh, bring Reagan to office. So there's a series of movements on the right that continue to put pressure on the party, the Republican Party, to move ever ever farther right but the tea party is the and, and abortion and yeah. the other social issues and i'll add choice. one other that's now the the next in that line and some people don't like this the phenomena characterized that way but donald trump is that is a social movement this is not 
a normal party-based electoral no. campaign as all, as we see the Republican Party seeking to find a way to, to stop him, essentially. Um, but back to the Tea Party, sorry. Yeah, uh, let's, let's talk about the emergence of the, of the Tea Party and their particular pressures on, yeah, on, and, on the Republican Party. And this party. is a complicated issue, and, and, and there, there are different groups that kind of uh, huddle under that broad umbrella. Uh, but, you know, the, the standard line is that the Tea Party is a response in large part to the bailout and to the kind of e economic dislocations uh, of, of the Great Recession and so forth. To a certain extent, I think that's true, but um, there's very, very good data on support for the Tea Party nationwide that shows that there's a heavy strain of very conservative racial attitudes animating the Tea Party as well. The best work on this is by a couple political scientists at the University of Washington. They actually uh, conducted surveys, really sophisticated surveys, across the country. And what they were seeking to explain in this with the survey data they collected was support for the Tea Party. Are you a strong, are you a, sort of essentially a member of the, tea, the, the movement as you see it, a, a supporter, a sympathizer, et cetera? And they run all sorts of very sophisticated models that incorporate lots of conventional kind of uh, standard political science variables to try to explain support for the Tea Party. And three factors emerge uh, as overwhelmingly the most important in helping us understand who aligns with the Tea Party. Hatred of Obama, uh, racial resentment, as they call it. Some others have called it old-fashioned racism. And the third is uh, a social dominance orientation, m meaning that all men, all people are not created equal, that some are deserving and some are not. And given the racial content of those attitudes, those, some of those who are not deserving or least deserving are minorities. So there's a very substantial racial strain to the Tea Party that is reflected, continues to be reflected in the politics of the Republican Party. There's just no question about it. So this white backlash that began 50 years ago with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act is still driving a good part of the American electorate, still animating social movements in, in this country, and that's absolutely the let, Tea let me, Party. Yeah, and let me, you know, there in. 68, you mentioned Nixon running on his Southern strategy. Quite explicitly, he was going to claim the electoral votes of the once solid Democratic South, and he and George Wallace did so in 68. He, at part of his standard stump speech during 68, he would say something like, uh, the New Deal was great because it uh, basically uh, reflected uh, taxing of the few for the benefit of the deserving many, where the Democrat, democratic liberalism of the 60s has gone off the rails <laughs> is that they are taxing the many for the benefit of the undeserving few. And in the coded racial language of the day, people can't sort of knew who the deserving and the, the undeserving were. Reflect on Romney's 47% remark. That's very similar. And uh, that feeds into the social dominance orientation. We are hardworking taxpayers, and there's all these freeloaders. And uh, racial minorities are among the worst offenders. So there's a real uh, a sort of ideological consistency to the sort of to the Republican campaign framing, if you will, for the last 50 years. Yeah. And we see it in Trump, <laughs> arguably more so than we've seen it with anybody. Remarks about Mexico not sending their best, sending rapists. I mean, anyway, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remain professorial. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> so j just to review what sociologists, uh, you have found in, in your studies that the, uh, the things that are really animating, motivating uh, people who think of themselves as being part of the Tea Party mm -hmm. movement is fear of Obama. Uh, or hatred of Obama, which has been fed by the Republican leadership that wanted to stymie and um, stop Obama from accomplishing yeah. anything. Uh, racial resentment, 
uh, which continues on the part of that, that backlash. Before we leave this term, I, I find it fascinating, social dominance orientation. That's more than just the racial divisions, though. That's, that's seen, that would be women, for example, yep. or LGBT community. Yep. There, there's no uh, any, yeah. People who are the other. Yes, and, and again, uh, the, the demographic composition of the United States is changing, changing rapidly. And there are lots of people in the country, lots of whites, who feel vaguely or not so vaguely threatened by that. And so, as you say, there's a whole bunch of others that have become targets for this kind of anger, backlash, confusion, fear, whatever you want to call it, that the country we know or that we, we thought we knew is slipping away from us. So it isn't all a matter about race. And economic dislocations do play into this, but I don't see that as the driving focus. Yeah, the, <clears throat> the media this, this, in covering this current campaign is talking about economic pain. Did you happen to see that New York Times article I emailed you? At a, the a, last a, minute I did, yeah. Yeah, uh, there was an article just in today's New York Times, if you want to look it up, it's titled, People Are Angry and the Problem is Other People. Uh, it goes through and documents that although the media has been kind of taking this uh, this line that oh people are feeling genuine economic pain and that's where that's what's driving this anger, most of the social measurements of no. how people are feeling economically, people are feeling pretty good and, and secure economically because the economy is in much better shape than it was at the beginning of, of Obama's term, and. It's these other things that are really driving this um, this anger, yep. and it's not directed at the top so much, but this social dominance orientation directed at, at others. And now the the fighting is between Republicans and Democrats, and within the Republican Party. Yeah, there's one other. Yeah, absolutely right. I I I I absolutely agree with the central thrust of that article, and thank you for sending it. Um, there's one other thing worth saying, and that is, in in saying that Congress has not been this polar, House of Representatives, for instance, has not been this polarized in our country's history, is not to say that the country is as polarized as Congress. In point of fact, it's not. Um, all sorts of survey data, including some that was referenced in this article, suggests that, look, the, the modal American is uh, an apolitical centrist to this day. If you look at time, if we were as deeply polarized across the board as you know some of our fevered rhetoric suggests, if you looked at time series data on a controversial issue, say immigration policy or abortion over the last 40 years, we should see real polarization in those positions. In fact, the trends are virtually flat. That is, the modal position on immigration reform, on gun control, on abortion, is a moderate centrist position. One of the big things that we're seeing is that movements, uh, the voice of movements has been powerfully amplified by our current system of primaries and caucuses. These are low, low turnout elections, and what we know from studies is those who participate are not representative voters. They are the mobilized ideological wings of the two parties. The activists in these the movements. The activists, and I think social movements are a powerful force for democracy, I am a big fan of social movements. On the other hand, we have to recognize that um, our current system of primaries and caucuses push the parties to the extreme at the start of a nominating process. Uh, and that hasn't always been the case. In fact, we talked, we devote a chapter in the book to where those that system of caucuses and reform, uh, caucuses and primaries came from. Uh, we can get into it if you want, but that's getting back into history. But that's a really important point. Movements have always been an important centrifugal force in American politics. Their influence has been magnified by 
the reforms that put our current system of primaries and caucuses into place. Uh, not, when, not to mention starting with uh, Iowa and then moving to the South. Um, it's it's front end loaded. It <laughs> is. And we, we saw this in 2012. This is not new. But in 2012, remember the awkward, painful dance we watched Mitt Romney try to engage in where he got pushed way far to the right in the primaries. Severely by, conservative, I think. Right, <laughs> but Santorum <laughs> and so forth, push, pushing him to the right. And then when he was, had the nomination, he tried to tap dance awkwardly <laughs> back to the center. Um, and the, the 2012 looks nothing. It looks positively civil and moderate relative to 2016. This, so we, there's something fundamentally structurally wrong with our current primary system that absolutely mutes the voice of the moderate centrist segment of the American populace, which remains the, the majority. We have a big problem, and it is, it is really corroding our democracy. Maybe both parties will learn something from this when they're both being challenged by uh, kind of insurgent yeah. movements and, and might look at ways that they can readjust the... Uh, well, the, the Democrats with super delegates have... That was one they, of the things they, they put in place that's, to try to... That's their safety valve. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I do want to get to our audience because uh, having them participate is always a big part of this, but a couple of things before we do that. You mentioned, uh, and I, I, I want to get into this, I, I, I agree, Trump, Trump's campaign as a movement itself. Talk about that a little bit. What, are you, what have been your thoughts on that? Um, are, well, are there defining features that you can point to? Uh, that make it a movement? Yeah, that makes you say it's... Well, uh, mostly the Republicans, Republican Party's reaction to it yeah. tells you everything you need to know about how it is not fundamentally rooted in the party. In a weird way, I'm obviously a much bigger Bernie fan than a Trump fan, but both of them are using the shells of the two parties or the vehicles of the two parties as a vehicle for movement energies. Um, and, and that was going to be my follow-up question. Yep. Bernie as movement, movement as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I, this is an editorial aside, but I like the effect that his campaign is having on the Democrats in that it has forced Hillary and the party in general to take more seriously a set of issues that in general have been sort of, they've held at arm's length for some period of time. Nonetheless, we still see that same centrifugal force operating on the Democratic Party this in this election year uh, the way we do in the, on the Republican side. We've seen these sorts of movements uh, to some degree in, in other um, presidential election years, mostly from third party tries. Right. You know, uh, Perot might have been seen as a movement sort of thing. Yep. Nader certainly. Yep. George Wallace uh, Absolutely. back then. None of those outlasted the, the current presidential campaign. Right. Do you see either the Trump movement or the Bernie movement having legs to go beyond mm -hmm. the... It's a great question. Uh, I, would, I would love to imagine that what, what I would consider the movement wing of the Democratic Party uh, staying mobilized and engaged, uh, playing a bigger role in the party uh, going forward. I don't know how likely that is. Yeah. I don't know. Um, on the, on the Republican side, this is, you said at the outset, this could be transformational. We won't know, but it's possible that it will be. Um, two scenarios. If, uh, Norm, Norm, Norman Col Norm Coleman, I think was a Senator from Minnesota. Yes. Was he governor? Was he Senator? senator. Yeah. He, he has been widely quoted as saying, if, in fact, Trump is the nominee, he could well bring the structure of the party down on top of itself. And that even the House, which uh, do, uh, doesn't, you know, is firmly in Republican control right now, could be in play if the fallout from this is as great as he, Coleman seems to be predicting. Uh, if that were to happen, I don't believe it, frankly. I, I say... We are on record in that book. One of the real 
uh, concerns we have is the, the just the absolute um, uh, sort of litany of extreme gerrymandering that's occurred over the last 10 years that essentially has reduced the number of competitive house districts to, depending on who you read, it's as few as two dozen, 435 house races. The maximum number that anybody says is truly competitive or swing districts yeah. is something like 70. That the modal district used to be a swing district. It isn't anymore because of extreme gerrymandering. So we, I've said, geez, the House ain't going anywhere. So even if Hillary's elected and the Senate flips back Democratic, uh, you're still going to have this powerful Republican veto power in, this, in the House. Yeah. Coleman believes it's in play. If that happened, even if it didn't happen in 2016, but it happened in 2020 because of ongoing fallout in the Republican Party, and you had a Democratic-controlled Congress and the shift, likely shift in the Supreme Court, we could be in a position where we would usher in an extended period of, of Democratic dominance in federal policymaking. We talk in this country as if every four years it's up for grabs and either side could win and there's tremendous volatility. There isn't. Depending on who you talk to, what political analyst you talk to, um, America is characterized by really stable, long electoral regimes. So the Democrats dominated federal policy making between 32 and 68. The Republicans have been generally dominant in federal policy making or have possessed this powerful veto power since 1980. This could be one of those pivotal elections that ends an extended period of Republican dominance and ushers in an extended period of Democratic dominance. That's a very real possibility. The other possibility, let me really scare you, <laughs> is there's two possibilities. One is that uh, it's looking more and more like a brokered convention, in which case I think Trump would be denied the nomination at the Republican convention. Probably it would be, Cruz would emerge as the nominee. The Donald is not going to go quietly into the night. Uh, I, I think I th he. I think this is his wet dream come true. Uh, frankly, <laughs> uh, we can edit that out. Um, <laughs> Why would we do that? I don't know. <laughs> Donald's going to be mad. And he's going to be tweeting. Them. Anyway, anyway, I think he would mount a third party challenge, and uh, that could really be and and he might say, and I'm making it. Per you know, this is now going to be a permanent third party. In which case, wow, would this be a transition, a, a transformational yeah. election? The other really scary possibility is if he runs as a third-party candidate, and it's Hillary and Cruz and Trump. It's very, very likely that Hillary would get the plurality of votes, but not enough electoral votes to win outright. And by the Constitution, the, the election is then resolved by the House, which is under conservative. Uh, Republican control. You could actually have a situation where Hillary finishes first, Trump finishes second, and Cruz is the next president. It wouldn't be the first time we had a second place person take the presidency. There's four. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the last two times it happened, really fun results, Gore Bush. <laughs> and 1876, when Rutherford B. Hayes became president by cutting a deal with Southern Democrats saying, you give me your votes in the House, I'll withdraw federal troops and we'll bring recon this reconstruction, reconstruction. We'll bring reconstruction to a close, ushering in one of the most horrific periods in American history. Good night, folks. You've been great. <laughs> <laughs> Just quickly on, on the gerrymandering and how hard it is to shake free some of these and how unlikely it is that the Republicans will lose control of the House. Right. Have you happened to have read Jane Mayer's um, Dark Money? Yes. Uh, the whole section in there after the 2010 elections and people like the Koch brothers and, and lots of their very wealthy allies set about purposely to put their money into okay. state and local elections and hired people to run what they called Project Red Map, where they sat down with computers and some of the brightest minds to draw these districts that could not be broken out of Republican control. And they could do it because the census had just been taken. They had just taken a lot of state houses. And those are there for at least until 2020 for the next cent census. Exactly. And the other thing that and you said, the brightest minds, it's also the new technology. It's the G GIS. 
So you can literally draw, we have a number of examples, I mean visual examples of these districts. They have no ge spatial integrity whatsoever. It's literally, there's a Republican, get him, get him, get him, get him. You can draw these things with extraordinary laser precision now. So everybody, you know, gerrymandering is as old as, you know, our republic, and both sides have done it. But you can now do it with su such sophistication that you can essentially create safe districts. And the, the decline in competitive house districts is a scandal that people don't seem to be aware of. Um, you know, between... A scandal and a scam, I would say. Uh, totally. And, and you know, uh, the, the Electoral College essentially denies voice to most of us in presidential years because we're in safe states. So there's only five or six battleground states. But it, historically, our House districts, which are closest to our lives, have been the most competitive. Not anymore. Not anymore. So very few people actually live in districts that are competitive. So, yeah, there's this one district. And the good news just <laughs> continues, doesn't it? <laughs> there's this one district that's become known as uh, the duck kicking a rabbit or something because of the, the you oh, yeah. know, the picture. That, oh, that, that they're it, so that bizarre. Draws. All right, let's get to our audience. If you want to ask a question, we ask you to raise your hand. Wait till the microphone gets there, and hold the mic. Uh, go right here was the first hand up, and please stand up and make it easy for our camera people. Um, in California, we now have an open primary, and I think the reason behind that was to try to stop the polarization in the primaries. Would you speculate upon the success of that and whether other states might pick up a model like that, and whether you think it's a good idea? Well, w w the results, uh, there have been a lot of research on this, and the open, open, open primaries generally do promote uh, uh, a, a more centrist outcome. There's there's less polarization. So, uh, but I'm going to be really interested to see what the result because people are studying this intensely this year because there's so much strategic use of the open primaries, with Democrats going to vote for Trump in open primary states because they see him as the the most vulnerable of the Republican candidates, and the same thing with Republicans actually going and voting for Bernie because they see him as more beatable than Hillary. Wouldn't they cancel each other out? <laughs> they might, but, <laughs> but if we're looking for ways to promote true kind of, uh, a kind of revitalization of the middle, this strategic use of open primaries uh, does not do the trick. So it's a complicated question. Okay, next in the audience, there's one right near you there, Crystal. Uh, thanks. I'm enjoying the discussion a lot. Um, could you talk a little bit more about contemporary racial politics, though? I mean, you had mentioned how important that is and it's sort of the history, the story bringing us today. We certainly have the Black Lives Matter and a lot of other things going on and a lot of changing demographics, economics, et cetera. So could you like sort of talk about today and maybe Absolutely. going forward as that figures in? Absolutely. Um, Thank well, you for that question. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think I've said my piece on the racial politics in the Republican Party. This, this, it, they've doubled down on uh, the party, uh, sort of uh, the party being a, essentially a, a coalition of con white conservatives, um, and all of the efforts to promote uh, new ID laws, etc. Uh, regardless of the claim that it's to combat voter fraud. This is fraudulent in itself. We haven't had a problem with voter fraud since the progressive era, basically. This is, these are efforts to, to, to uh, restrict the franchise um, and, and to cut in to make it more difficult for, for Democratic constituents to vote, uh, with the special emphasis being on racial minorities. Um, so the Republican version of racial politics is pretty clear on its face and has been more or less in place for 50 years. The Democrats, uh, you know, yes, African-American voters have been the most loyal component in a sense of the Democratic coalition since Nixon, six, since 68. Um, and that hasn't changed, but there's real anger because of the failure of the Democratic Party to embrace the issues 
that are being powerfully articulated by Black Lives Matter and in, to a certain extent by the Sanders campaign. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's obviously um, uh, safe to bet that African American voters, if it winds up being, say, Cruz Hillary or Trump Hillary, that the, the great majority of African American voters will support the Democratic Party. But there's real tensions there. In some ways, the most interesting is the increasing importance of Hispanic voters. Hispanic voters historically have been a, a quite a competitive group. That is, that is in, a, in electoral terms. Part of this is because that's a very vague umbrella. The, the differences that under that umbrella are almost as important as the similarities. So Cubans and Dominicans and Mexican Americans, these are not the same populations. Historically, though, the, for a long time, it was about a 60-40 split. It was pretty consistent for a lot of years. 60% Democratic, 40% Republican, um, with lots of Hispanic voters torn between the kind of more uh, liberal uh, economic uh, and tax policies of the Democrats, but attracted in some ways to the social conservative, uh, sort of some of the social conservative issues that aligned with Republicans. Um, after 2012, this is obviously the fastest growing segment of the electorate. After Romney lost in 2012, lots of Republican analysts said, look, the demographic noose is tightening on the Republican Party. They have to reach out and appeal to other groups. Hispanics have in the past been at least open to re supporting Republican candidates. George W. Bush routinely got 40% of the Hispanic vote. And people said, yeah, they're going to have to do that. Marco Rubio bet that they were going to do it and took a lead on, on helping to co-author or author the, the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill that came out of the Senate and was immediately dead on arrival in the House. And he got slammed for being moderate on immigration during this year's election. Um, when Trump literally announced he was his candidacy with his remark about they're sending us rapists, I remember watching going, He's dead the night he declares. <laughs> I think a lot of people. Oh yeah, that. <laughs> and the the split over the last two elections has been 75-25. So Hispanics have been favoring Democrats by a three to one margin. Um, if Trump winds up being the nominee, I, I'll be fascinated to see what where that number goes. Uh, so, to me, that's the most interesting aspect of racial or ethnic politics in the contemporary United States. And how it plays out in this election is going to be hugely important going forward. It's a great question. Thank you. All right. More hands. Come on up front here, Crystal, over to this corner. And then maybe stay up here because there's some more in the front. And again, hold it up close. I'm holding. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just care I wasn't holding on to. Oh. Um, some people have said that the resolution is an actuary a rev resolution, that age is going to handle a whole lot of the angry white male mm -hmm. issues. Um, what are you saying? <laughs> Wait, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> I've gone off my meds. Yes. <laughs> the young people coming up have the reality of universal decline in opportunity and global warming. So how does the demographics play into the shared reality that young people are bringing to their voting positions? How does that play out here? Great. It's a great that, question. That is a good question because we're seeing a lot of differences in age groups, yep. how they're, they're voting in both parties. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, the, the demographic change that I mentioned, again, again, the decreasing percent of the electorate that's white is huge. And it's, you know, that's going to powerfully shape, reshape American politics very quickly, if not this, this election year. But you're right. Um, we're seeing really distinctive patterns of, of sort of, of voter preference among the youngest voters. Now, Historically, they also vote in the lowest numbers, and there's no reason to think that's going to change this year. So that remains a certain kind of handicap or drag on their participation. But um, uh, young, young 
voters, the youngest voters, have in the last two elections aligned much more strongly with Democrats than at any time since the youth, the 18-year-olds received the vote. Um, again, it looks like that trend will continue this year. And to the extent that you're creating a generation who identifies strongly with the Republican, uh, sorry, the Democratic Party, couple that with the demographic, the decline of the white electorate, that's part of the reason that I actually am expecting that this could be a transformational election that uh, creates a solid, reliable ele a electoral foundation for a sustained period of democratic dominance in federal policymaking. It's the combination of the distinctive kind of preferences of youth coupled with the decline in the white electorate that could create that stage. But who knows? Okay, back to the audience. Um, Crystal, over there in the second row, over by camera one, if you would. Thank you. Thank, thank you for... Uh, Stand up, please. Oh, thank you for your, um, you know, um, talk and stuff. It's really interesting. I'm wondering, because you're talking about the separation between white backlash and minority voters, I'm wondering if there's a... Um, can, can you see a, a way w where they can bridge the gap between white... Uh, backlash and minority groups. I know in 1968, Bobby Kennedy attracted blue collar and minority voters. And in 1988, Jesse Jackson tried to build a rainbow coalition of uh, white working class and minorities. Do you think that's possible or are the values of the two groups too separate, maybe? I, I don't know. No, not at all. I mean, uh, you know, 60% of those who voted for Obama were white. Uh, Obama was a kind of broadly coalitional figure. Um, uh, you know, the w white America is not a homogeneous population. And I, I think we see all sorts of instances of candidates who are able to uh, forge pretty powerful cross-class, cross cross-race coalitions. Um, and again, going forward, the, the whites are expected to be a minority of the electorate by, I think it's 2036 or something. You know, that ain't too far down the road. So uh, the idea that somehow, um, you know, a, a party that is o oriented pr overwhelmingly to white voters can be successful, you know, that. That 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 the sand is ticking or is dripping through that that you know, I don't know what analogy I'm trying to draw. <laughs> like that, sand that, through an hour. Thank you so <laughs> very much, Paul. That's why you're the moderator. Yeah. Um, so I see lots of examples of that. And again, the Obama's two a two-term presidency is a pretty powerful uh, affirmation of those possibilities. Okay, uh, over here in the center aisle, Crystal, come up around front here. And can we see some hands? Who wants to be next? So I'll, I'll know where to send her. OK. Hi. Thanks for a great talk. Um, you have uh, sort of s touched a number of times tonight on um, the changing demographics and the rising power that millennials have, um, should they choose to use it. Um, and when you've talked about potential matchups, you've talked pretty much entirely about Clinton and Trump and Clinton and Cruz. And I'm just curious to know if you see that as a potential for what's going to move the Democratic Party in the future. Um, how do you see Bernie Sanders' candidacy uh, playing into that now? Well, uh, Bernie is clearly, and this is a, this is a big question. Uh, Bernie has clearly, or that campaign, and I think to a certain extent Black Lives Matter as well, uh, has I mean, I teach at Stanford. I, you know, I, I teach classes with 18, 19, 20, 21-year-olds. And the level of generalized uh, alienation from politics, say, two years ago, three years ago, was palpable. Uh, and yet, clearly, they, they are, they find that, uh, Sanders' campaign speaks to them, at least to many of them. And so does Black Lives Matter. It feels more authentic. It, it, so 
Hillary does not excite. And the question is, I, again, I think uh, Sanders' campaign has had a really powerful effect. Uh, that centrifugal force I'm talking about, it's pushed the Democratic Party, it's pushed Hillary to engage issues that, at some, to a certain degree, she's held at arm's length. Most Democrats have. Um, and I see that as a real positive. The question is, do the millennials participate in the Sanders campaign, see Bernie marginalized at some point, say all sorts of positive things about Hillary, Hillary very gracious in, you know, in, toward Bernie, but how do we build that, uh, that authentic voice into the Democratic Party so that the millennials do not, aren't frustrated come the fall and next year and go, I was, you know, I was sold a bill of goods. I was right to be cynical all along. That's, that's the challenge to me, or one of the big challenges for the Democratic Party is how do you broaden the base of the party in a, in a real way and not just every four years you, you kind of gesture to their interest. So I'm hoping uh, that this, this becomes or is the start of a, a certain kind of transformational moment within the Democratic Party. But we'll have to see. Okay, next one over here. If you would stand up, please. A lot of people I've been talking to are wondering, is Trump a fascist? Now, I use that term advisedly mm -hmm. because it's, fascist doesn't mean just any right winger that you no. don't like but in the sense of the marriage of government and industry, as in Nazi Germany, is he uh, a proto-fascist or a fascist in that ide ideological sense? Um, and just when I thought it could, no. <laughs> um, it's a great question. I don't think so because I don't, uh, whatever else you want to say about Hitler, and we can say a lot, he actually had the strength of his convictions. They were twisted, strange convictions. Trump, <laughs> I, think, I think he's an opportunist. So The twisted and strange is there. Twisted and strange, <laughs> but fascism in the, in, in the form of the classic fascist leaders really was the wedding of a very extreme ideology that was deeply felt and believed in with lots of efforts to inculcate it, uh, it wasn't simply government aligned with industry. We've had that in this country for a long time, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, so I don't think so. He, he's a game show host to me. I mean, it's so bizarre because we have him on tape from 10, 15 years ago leaving the Republican Party because they were becoming so extreme and taking up all sorts of positions that are not conservative. I mean, that's the, the thing that really rattles conservative Republicans is they don't believe he's one of them. So I, I think, you know, when he says he wants to keep everything, all his options open, he literally means it because he doesn't know what he, he does not have any clear, consistent policy preferences. So it's hard to characterize somebody as a fascist who has no compass. <laughs> Let me follow up on that for a little bit. There's some of the things I've read in looking at this strange election year is talked about things like um, authoritarian scale or something like that. that a, a lot of the Trump supporters in particular are just looking for a strong leader, right. someone who will tell it like it is. Right. Um, that's different than, than fascism, um, being the, the strong, almost father figure sort right. of thing. Have your studies looked into that as, as a dynamic a, at all? Or I haven't, no. Uh, I leave that to social psycho or psychologists, or so <laughs> abnormal psychologists. <laughs> um, no. There, there is a way that authoritarianism arises with sure. the you know, the willing participation of the population. Yeah, it's strange, though, because in... Uh, Germany in the 20s and 30s, or Italy in the 20s and 30s, the level of social disorganization, the level of economic dislocation was extraordinary. Yeah. And it created, I mean, there, it literally, these, these were societies that were 
deeply fractured. Yeah, there's a and vacuum. In there's there. a huge vacuum. <clears throat> Again, if you if you look at the aggregate data in the United States, this was in the article you sent yeah. me. People are. I'm not, I'm not saying we're all thrilled with the nature of of American society and that you know there's incredible inequities, et cetera, et cetera. But in the aggregate, what's happened on during the Obama years is quite extraordinary in terms of uh, decrease in unemployment, um, you know, in general, a kind of stabilization of the economy. And as you point out, most Americans in their survey responses, how do you feel about the country, they're more, op or more positive about the state of the country now than since the late 50s. Yeah. So the idea that we need Donald to save us from <laughs> It just doesn't wash. And again, when he's saying things like, I'm not going to disavow David Duke, and I, you know, Mexico's sending, we're going to build a wall, and it's, it's much more about this, this felt sense of fear that the world is, our, our country is changing, and that there's a, a whole set of, a lot of others out there who we feel vaguely threatened by. Not about generalized social dislocation and economic troubles. Uh, that, that's my take. Let me, uh, we're almost out of time. I'm sorry, we're, we're almost out of time here, but uh, let me take one moment for a little bit of business. If you are not registered to vote yet, you have until <laughs> May 25th to do that. The uh, primary election is June 7th. And as uh, Debbie brought up earlier about the, the open primary, if you are registered with a particular party, you will only get a ballot for that party. So if you wanted to vote, say, for example, in the Democratic primary, <laughs> you need to either be registered in, with the Democratic Party or as a no party preference. The Democratic Party will take no party preference. If you want to do that, when you get to the polling place, place, ask for a Democratic Party ballot. If you vote by mail, you have to call your county elections office and request one ahead of time. If you're registered green, for example, and you want to vote in the Democratic Party primary because maybe somebody's running in that primary that you really want to vote for, you need to re-register and change your party registration or you won't be able to do that. So May 25th, pay attention to your party depending on what primary you want to uh, vote in, and June 7th is the election. And we have about 30 or 40 seconds left. Send us out on a positive note, guys. <laughs> The Giants won last night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. You've been watching Other Voices, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. We're here on the first Tuesday of every month, only on those, except for those months when we're not. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, um, Doug McAdam, author of Deeply Divided, soon to be out in paperback. Racial politics uh, and social movements in the post-war America. You just haven't gotten your copy. That's right. Okay. And thank you all for uh, joining us here tonight. Thank you.